Hello and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Gennari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. This is episode Nomadic Civilizations for History 101. So being nomadic is the natural state of human civilization. We were, for most of our existence, as a species, as a genus, as a as a human, nomadic. We walked the earth looking for food. Homo erectus left Africa around 1.75 million years ago. The Neanderthals, their ancestor, left Africa 400,000 years ago. And Homo sapiens, us, we are Homo sapiens, left Africa 130,000 years ago. So humans have always been on the move searching for food. So that lifestyle is a hunter-gatherer lifestyle. You hunt animals for protein. You gather roots, veggies, fruits, and nuts. Okay, so who does this work? We have people. We have men. We have women. We have children. Who does this work? Well, men do the hunting and women do the gathering, which makes complete sense. It's very patriarchal. The men do the hunting, hunt, hunt, hunt. They, they go after the roast beef. They kill the meats. They bring home the bacon. And the women gather. The women get the roots and the veggies and the fruits and the nuts. And they collect and they pick. So who's more important? Whose calories are more important? The protein the men bring home? Or the fruit the women bring. Obviously, it's the women. The women's calories are more important because they are more regular. And that has an effect on the society. See, if you've ever gone hunting, you know this. You know gathering is easier. Because you can go out hunting and you can sit in your blind for eight hours and get nothing, not see a thing. You could spend all that time tromping through the woods, walking through the woods, trying to find something and get nothing. You could go all season and get nothing. That's a lot of energy spent for zero gain. Women, on the other hand, you find the roots, you dig them up, you find the veggies, you dig them up, you find the fruit and you pick them, you find the nuts and you pick them. And there's probably more than you could pick in one day, so you could go back. So women's calories are more important. Most people will eat a root, veggie, fruit, nut diet with some animal protein thrown in because the women's calories are are more regular. That has an effect on society. Women gain rights. Women have rights in nomadic societies because they are economically important. So women gain control over their bodies. They get a decision in marriage. They get to decide who will be the father of their children. Now, not them just alone. They don't marry for love. Though love might be on important part of the decision but everyone's going to want to have a say because who marries who and who's going to raise the children are important to the entire society so not only the parents of the woman but the parents of the boy the parents of the man and other families are going to be like well you know jane really shouldn't marry bill bill i don't know you know they're all going to have a say and that's going to tell us something about how communal this society is and we'll get to that but women have rights and especially control over their body. So the idea that the caveman hits the woman over the head and drags her over to the cave to have sex with her and rape her just isn't really true. 
women had rights. They had a decision over marriage. They have important jobs. They're economically important. And so since they're economically important, they'll have important social jobs, priestesses, judges, midwives, doctors, sometimes a leader or a warrior. This is your Wonder Woman, right? Living in a society of female warriors. That's what the Amazons are. Now, the Amazons are a Greek story, but they, there were a basis based on nomadic horse peoples that women knew how to fight. They knew how to shoot a bow, stab things, because you had to be able to survive as a hunter-gatherer. So women can do hunting as well. They could shoot a bow. They could throw a spear. They're definitely going to be the midwife doctor. Who else knows how to deliver a baby? A woman who has given birth. So men don't know anything about delivering babies. It's kind of weird that in the 20th century, men took over baby delivering as doctors, quote unquote, as doctors. Well, they're professionals. Right? But through all of history, women delivered babies. Why? Because women know women's bodies. Far better than men know women's bodies. So, what is their lifestyle? What is the lifestyle of a hunter-gatherer nomads? Well, it's poverty. That's the big thing. It's poverty. You could only own what you carried from place to place. Which isn't that much. Imagine living. Everything you own is in your backpack. That's essentially how much hunter-gatherers live, lived on. And so they're communist. But the communism has a quote-unquote. They're not Marxist. They're not Leninist. They're not Stalinist. They're not modern communists. But they're communalists. They're communists in the communal sense of the word. They share everything. Because everyone contributes to the whole. Everyone contributes what they can. So young men go and hunt. Young women go and pick berries. Older women take care of children. Older men take care of children. And then the women and the men come home and then they take care of children. They take care of horses. They take, take care of the goats. They feed the sheep. Everyone contributes what they can do and everyone gets what they need. So you don't own the deer you, you killed. The group owns it. The tribe owns it. And everyone will eat at that. Why? Well, first, the deer meat will go bad before you eat it. If it's just you, you can't eat 800 pounds of deer meat. The second thing is, what happens when you don't catch or your group doesn't catch the deer? And some other group does. And they bring home an antelope. Well, you'll get to eat then. And so it's no ownership of property, of items, of even children. Everything is in common because everyone relies on everybody else to survive. These people live on such the edge of existence that if everyone doesn't contribute, the entire system falls apart. But everyone also needs from the group. So the group is more important than the individual. And this is communism. So it's it's a funny thing when you hear people on, when I hear people on the news or, or commentators or uh, politicians say, communism has never worked. Communism is the way humans lived for the first four and a half million years we existed. From whatever the first human is, all the way to around 10,000 BCE, millions of years we lived as communists. And there's communism in other societies throughout history, from, from communes in the 60s to early Christians. Communism does work. Now, you may make the argument you need poverty. Maybe. Hunter-gatherers are poor by any definition of a modern concept. They can't own much stuff. So they don't own anything. They share everything. What about warfare? Well, war is natural. War is every day. War is a competition over food supplies. 
So war is brutal at the nomadic level. Why? Because it's either you get to eat or you might starve. So what is the purpose of war? Victory. The complete destruction of your competition. It is to wipe out the other tribe. It's not to win land. Because land doesn't matter. You're gathering off the land. You're hunting the land. And then you're moving on. So there's no borders. You are trying to wipe out your competition for food. Sorry, Neanderthals. You got wiped out. So what happens? You kill the men. Because they're useless. And they're disruptive. They might revolt. You kill the men. You absorb the women. And you enslave and assimilate the children. So you kill the men because the a different tribe's men might fight back, might reject you, might revolt against you. So you kill them. You absorb the women. Why? Well, because you need to replace women because of the high rate of death in childbirth. I've done research. I've tried to find it. It is anywhere from 10% to 40%. No one really knows it's high. And the reason why is, one, nobody knows anything about delivering babies. Even the midwives just have experience. They don't know biology at all. The second thing is, you give birth in the dirt. There's no concept of germs. There's no concept of sterilization. People have got dirt on their hands. The third is, if you have given birth, you know it's a messy experience. And lots of stuff comes out. Well, the stuff that comes out allows things to come in. And so we have what the British in the 19th century would have called childbed fever. You know, sepsis is is a blood infection. You give birth. Three days later, you have a fever. And three days after that, you're dead. So women are dying all the time in childbirth. This is one reason why women in the ancient world are not as big on monogamy as you would be like, as you might be. You're like, oh my God, like Odysseus has sex with lots of different women. Penelope's not, not, he's, she's oh, not great with it, but also not really against it. And you go, well, why? And the answer is, well, every time you have sex, you might get pregnant. And that pregnancy might kill you. So every time you have sex, you're playing Russian roulette. Think about that. Think about if every time you had sex was like pointing a gun at your face. That might kill you in nine months. That might go off in nine months. You'd be a little wary of, of all having lots of sex. You'd be a little wary of like, well, you know, you know. You'd want to have the one kid, the two kids. You need the kids to survive. You need enough kids to survive to adulthood that will take care of you when you're old. But once you get there, you're like, you know. So in war, one of the goals is to absorb the women. Now, absorb is a nice word because part of the thing is, well, does it mean rape? And the answer is, by any modern definition, yes. These women will be having sex with men they did not choose, and they don't really have a say about it. So will these women be raped? Yes, by any modern definition. The problem with that, with just saying rape, and that's why I don't use the word rape, as the description is, they will be assimilated. They will become wives. They will become mothers. They will become part of the tribe. Kind of like the Anglo woman in Dances with Wolves. Genghis Khan's wife. Who's kidnapped and absorbed into another tribe. So they get the rights of being a wife and a mother and a woman in a new tribe. They get assimilated in. But in the early days, is there a moment when they're in a tent and some dude walks in and says, we're now married. Or the group 
takes a woman and says, your husband's dead. Sorry, he's stupid. And Worf is your new husband. Uh, they do a couple of words. They bind some hands and boom. And that night, you're having sex with a man you who might have killed your husband. Yeah. And is that rape? By a modern definition? Yeah. Sure. But they're not slaves. And that's important. They're not sex slaves. They're not slaves. They are assimilated in as women of the tribe. Now, the children are kind of enslaved because the enslavement part is about their labor. You, you kidnap the kids. You assimilate the kids. You take the kids because you have a lot of jobs like feeding the goats that a man doesn't want to do. And so you need them for labor. You need children for labor, for future labor. And to be future adults. Now, here's the problem. You have a seven-year-old boy that you, you absorb into your tribe. You kidnap, right? You murder their, his father, right? Or his mother and his mother. Or you absorb their mother. You bring the kid in. What are you going to do with this kid? Well, at seven, you give him all these little jobs. But one day, that kid will become 18-year-old man. And that 18-year-old, that 21-year-old man could stab you in, your, in the night. That's a problem. So how do you stop that kid from stabbing you when he's an adult and continue to give you labor to make your life better, to go from feeding the goats to going hunting for antelope? Well, you assimilate them. You probably have them marry your daughter, right? Or your niece. So they're working for you, and now they're your daughter-in-law, they're your son-in-law. Well, he's not going to murder you because he's now going to become a man of the tribe. So like women, they're assimilated. Children become assimilated as they get older. And this is an important thing to understand about slavery. We're not talking American or West Hemispheric chattel slavery. The slavery here is for labor. And the important part about that is as these slaves continue, their labor will be incorporated into the tribe and eventually they will be incorporated into the tribe. There is no kind of slave forever or generational slavery. By the time they become a teen, become an adult, they're being absorbed in. Because remember, slaves don't like being slaves. And if you are a tribe, you can't have 20% of your young men murder people in the night, hate you. You absorb them in. So you they marry the daughters. And so within a generation, they're not, they're not slaves anymore. They might not be leaders of the society, but they might grow into be like second or third level important men. You know, depending on how good at hunting they are, how good at war they are. What happens if you're defeated? You have the complete eradication of a tribe. Likely starvation. You get kicked off the land. You get kicked off the area where you were had food. And you will be destroyed. So rule one, don't lose. And that is a big rule. You should start it. You should, you should put an exclamation point there. Because that is rule one of this class. Don't lose. When you lose, whether it's the, to the Assyrians or to the Egyptians or to um, Alexander the Great, or to the Romans, bad things happen to you. Do not lose. And losing as a nomadic person is eradication. Your men are dead, the women are absorbed, and your children are enslaved. If you get away, great. Lots of men are dead. You've got women... And you got children who you now need to feed and you've been kicked off the fruitful land that you were on. So now you're facing starvation. And this becomes even more with the horse. The horse changes everything. Everything. Domestication of the horse changes nomadic societies, changes human societies. And in fact, the horse will be the most important aspect of war until the invention of the machine gun. It will decline with the invention of the musket, 
but it will continue. The Swedish army, the French army and the Napoleon cavalry still mattered. It's the machine gun that kind of ends the cavalry charge. Now, what does, why does the horse change everything? Why does the horse change nomadic society? Well, first it's, it allows you more wealth. It's like having a car. You could carry more. Think about all the junk you have in your car versus all the junk you have in your backpack. When you're, when you're living out of your backpack, you have to be very precise what you have in your backpack. Your car, you could put a DVD player in there. You could have a PlayStation. You can have, I mean, what's in your trunk? You might not even know there's so much stuff. That more wealth, the ability to carry more equaled more survival. S secondly, you have a strategic advantage if you domesticate the horse. You can travel more places. You can cover more distance. You could find more food. You can go to a valley, find there's no food there, leave that valley, get to a new valley, find more food before the snows come. You can survive mistakes. The strategic advantage of speed and distance allows you to survive mistakes. In warfare, you get a tactical advantage of gravity and momentum. See, if you're eight feet up in the air on a horse, you're swinging down, you're stabbing down. That means gravity is on your side. It's way easier to stab down than to stab up. Plus, you have momentum. If you shoot a bow, if you're on your horse flying at 20 miles an hour and you shoot the bow, you, the bow power, the arrow power that is let loose is a combination of the bow strength, your arm strength, and the 20 miles per hour you're moving. So as opposed to standing on flat earth, if you're f moving on a horse, your striking power is 20 miles an hour heavier than if you're standing there. So that gives you more success at war. And we're going to see this. Nomadic peoples are going to constantly scare settled peoples well into the invention of the gun. Well into the 1600s. In fact, think about your Bible, those of you who are Christians. Though if you're Muslim, you might have the same story of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, the end of the world. How did Roman Christians think about the end of the world? They didn't think about armies. They thought about nomadic horsemen coming to get them. Nomadic horsemen, men riding on horses was war and death and pestilence and starvation. That's what they brought to settled peoples of the Roman empire, the height of the Roman empire. Because the, the book of Revelations is written somewhere around 100 AD. That's the height of the Roman Empire. What scared the Romans? Not armies. Not civilization. Not other peoples living in cities. But horsemen. The horsemen of the plains. The horsemen of the steppe. That's what scared them. And that's going to be true through most of this course. Nomadic peoples. We're going to end with... Genghis Khan and the Mongols wiping out lots of civilizations, obliterating huge cities, burning everything down, murdering millions of people. And they're going to do it on their horses. So settled peoples are going to have to deal with that horse because it's a long time before we invent the musket and it's even longer before we invent the machine gun. Okay. So what is the effect? Well, people who domesticated the horses, not all nomadic peoples domesticate the horses. You had to have horses. You had to have a place that could feed horses. You had to be able to, to actually domesticate them. You had to know how. You had to figure out how. So people who domesticate the horses dominate the flatlands, what's called the steppe, S-T-E-P-P-E. -E. That runs from northern China all the way to eastern Europe. It's 8,000, 10,000 miles long. It's a great grass highway. It's like Wyoming, but forever. And since they have these military advantages, what they do is eradicate non-horsed peoples on the steppe. They destroy their competition of 
they they fight their competition of other horse nomads. And so the steppe breaks up into these groups of different horse peoples. Well, what happens to non-horse peoples? Well, those get either eradicated or they get out of the way. Move, nomad, get out the way. Get out the way, nomad, get out the way. Move. And where do they go? Well, they can't stay on the steppe. So where do they go? They go to places that horses can't go easily. Mountains, forests, river valleys. But those are worse food zones. The food is harder to get. There's less of it. You go up into the Himalayas, you're protected from horses. That's great. How much food grows naturally up there at 10,000 feet? So all of a sudden, you're protected from horses, but you are in worse food zones. That's going to matter. Remember that. So we get a world that is being bifurcated, that's being broken up between those who domesticate horses and those who don't. And those who don't domesticate horses have to run into places horses find it hard to go. Mountains, forests, and rivers. River valleys. I mean, not literally the river, but the river valley, which is a lot of mud and muck and gunk. And it's not, it's just not very good for horses to travel around. It's not a lot of food for horses. What about government? Okay. I get a lot of students who will tell me, oh, nomads had no government. Of course they have government. But it's personal. It's not institutional. It's Game of Thrones. A call who cannot ride is no call. It's Sons of Anarchy. It is an individual. You follow the person. Not the institution. So if you're in the military, or you know someone's in the military, you know they take an oath of loyalty to the Constitution of the United States, not the president. In nomadic societies, you're taking an oath of loyalty to the person, to the president. It's personal. It's in the person. So who gets to be the leader? Well, it's a complicated, always flowing, never written down mix. It's based on kinship. Who are you related to? Sons of Anarchy, right? If you ever watch Sons of Anarchy, you know the guy who wants or should be the leader is the son of the ex-leader. And his, like, uncle stepped in. The brother of the ex-leader, of the, of the deceased ex-leader, took over. But they're related. It's not some stranger. A lot of it is who you related to. Are you related to this? Are you related? Are you the son, the nephew, the brother of a successful king? I mean, not, the, I'm sorry. These are not kings. A successful chief, a successful leader. Then you have a claim on that. Are you son of the horse thief? You're not going to get to be leader. Second, you have to have charisma. People have to want to follow you. People have to like you just because you're you. You need strength of character. Charisma, uh, let's go back to charisma for a second. Um, it's, why, it's why people follow Harry Potter and not Ron Weasley. Right? It's why, and that's and actually a whole book about Ron being upset. Why does Harry get to be in charge? Why is he so special? Why is he the chosen one? Well, part of it is people like Harry. They don't really like Ron all that much. There's a reason why Harry is the cap becomes the captain of the Quidditch team. It's because people want to follow him. It's why Harry is in charge of Dumbledore's army. People want to follow him. He's not the best sorcerer. He's not the best wizard. The, sh the books continuously tell you he's not the best. But he's related to important people. And people like him from the very beginning. It's also um, why Draco Malfoy is in charge, basically, of that of the 11-year-olds uh, in Slytherin. 
Yeah, he's related to an important guy. But people also like him. They follow him. He's got a crew. Whereas his his stooges, his crew, no one's following his crew. Because they aren't charismatic. You need strength of character. Again, Harry Potter. Or Draco Malfoy. You need someone who stands up. This is the call who cannot write is no call. You lead by example. People want to follow you. So you have a strength, not just physical strength, but a strength of character, a morality, a value system. You gain legitimacy by the protection of the tribe. Now, I guess we should talk about what legitimacy is. Legitimacy is the ability to get other people to accept your right to tell you what to do. It's the ability to get other people to accept your right to tell them what to do. Legitimacy is people accept. I accept who the president is. I accept who um, is in charge of my committees. I, they have legitimacy. They're, now, there's lots of ways you could get legitimacy. And we'll talk about a lot of them. And we'll talk about what happens when you lose legitimacy. And it's never good when you lose legitimacy. So how do you gain legitimacy? You, you gain it by protecting the tribe, by finding food and being successful in war. And if you're successful, you get to keep being the government. You get to keep being the chief. People accept you. That's Khal Drogo in Game of Thrones. He has the longest hair because he's never lost a battle. So people accept him being in charge. He keeps winning. If you're a failure, you're going to get removed. People do not have time. You do not have four years to figure it out. You do not have time to grow into being a leader. You better be a good leader or you're going to be exed. You're going to be gone. You're going to be murdered in your sleep and removed. So the advantage is that you get good leadership because there's no time for bad leadership. None. And consensus creates stability. People accept someone as leader. You get consensus. And everyone accepts it. So when someone goes, oh, I don't really know about this leader, everyone else goes, well, what's the problem? We all like him. So we're following him. And you go, okay, I'll follow him too. The disadvantage is the constant turnover. War, right? You could get killed in battle. And there's no clear succession. Who comes next? No one really knows. It could be a brother. It could be his son. But if the son's too young, then maybe not. It could be a cousin. It could be someone not related to the chief. But someone of another family who's a better military leader, who's a better hunter. You know, every generation has to figure out who their, who their leader is going to be. And that can create conflict. Attila the Hun died. He had a brain aneurysm and he died. Right? He had two brothers. Both brothers looked at each other and said, I'm in charge. No, no, no. I'm in charge. No, no, no. I'm in charge. And the people looked at them and said, he's in charge. No, 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 no. He's in charge. And what happened is the Huns broke into two. One followed one brother, one followed another brother. This actually happens in Game of Thrones in the end of the first season when when Khal Drogo dies and there's like five different people who are all like, I'm in charge. And then there's D Daenerys who's like, well, I guess I'll just light myself on fire and with my dragons, with my dragon eggs. And she ends up with the like foreigners and the weak women and like she's not really part. She, she gets a tribe. They follow her. But the Khal Drogo's tribe breaks up into parts. Daenerys will unite them again by murdering all those guys. In, you know, season whatever, five, six, seven. But the disadvantage is conflict creates factions. Now women play a large role in consensus. And in conflict and in determining leadership, women are very big in this. They're all playing the behind the scenes stuff, 
promoting some children, hurting others, getting good marriages. There's a lot of that. And we'll see that when we do, especially like the Turks or the Arabs, peoples who are recently settled um, nomadic peoples have a lot of this. Um, China will have this. Korea will have this. Now, they're more settled than, say, the Turks or the Arabs will be when we talk about them. Um, but, uh, you know, part of it is also the harem. If Do you have a emperor who can have lots of wives and or lots of lovers? So there's a uh, uh, women are important in this. Women have a role to play in determining who will be the next leader. So that brings us to law. How does law work? Well, nomadic peoples have laws. What are those laws? Well, these are people who cannot read or write. They have no written language. So their laws are based on traditions. If it worked in the past, they'll continue to do it. It worked. Remember, if they do something new and it fails, they starve or they get wiped out, right? The men are dead, the women are raped, the children are enslaved, right? So this is a very conservative society. Nomadic peoples are conservative. They don't like risking new things. They don't like change because if they try something new and it fails, it's disaster. So these are very conservative societies. Well, who knows what the traditions are? Who knows what people used to do in the past? You don't have any written record, so the only record you have is the memories of old people. So old folk are in charge of the law. Because the society is also communal. Everyone has an interest in justice. Everyone. You can't have someone get away with being a horse thief or stealing an antelope and using it for themselves. You don't have you can't survive with selfishness. So it's based on traditions. Everyone has an interest. The people are illiterate, meaning they can't read or write. So old folks know the rules and they maintain the rules. The old folks get together and they go, we know what, you know, remember what it used to be. Remember what the punishment used to be when, when you stole a horse? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You cut off uh, all of his pinkies. Like, no, no, no. That's if you stole a goat. Oh, yeah, that's right. So what is it about the horse? You pay two chickens. Really? It's just two chickens? The pinkies are for the goat, but the horses the two chickens? Okay, I guess that's fine. It, makes, it doesn't sound right. Right? And you have these conversations. So what does this happen? You get consensus. Everyone agrees on the rules. The old people get together. And they go, what is the punishment going to be for this guy who stole a horse? And they talk about it. This is, in some ways, where our jury comes from. Now, our system comes from the Romans, but it's you can see this group. You have a group of people standing in judgment of a person and going, well, what should the punishment be? What did he do? Did he do it? He did it. He did it. Okay, what should, we cut off his pinkies. And the people will go, no, 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 no. He's not cutting off his pinkies. No, no, no. No, 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 no. We give him the two chickens. He has to give back the two chickens. Whoa. Oh, oh, but okay. Two chickens. I get, I, isn't that a little light? And someone's like, yeah, it's a little light, but you know, he's got two young babies and you know, he needs the pinkies to draw the bow. He's good at bow shooting. And you know, and like, oh yeah, that's true. And, and they come to a consensus. They agree. It's a case by case negotiation. Why? Because I wake up and my horse is stolen, right? It's not really my horse. So this is a bad, kind of a bad example to start with, but I'm missing a cow, right? And Billy stole my cow. And how do I know? Because I go down to the place where everyone drinks and, and gets drunk and I go in and go, I'm missing a cow. And they go, oh, Billy was just in here and he found a cow. So what do I do? Well, I go to my grandpa. I don't go to Billy because now we're going to have a fight. So we're going to not going to do that. I'm going to go to my grandpa. Go, Billy stole my cow. <coughs> what does Billy, what does my grandpa do? He calls up Billy's grandpa or Billy's grandma because women are in charge too. Remember, they're old. If women or if there's old women, they know what the rules are too. And so 
he calls up Billy's grandma and says, we have to have a sit down. And so they get together. But all the other old people show up, too, because they want to be a part of this. And they all have, like, chicken parm. They all sit down and they eat. And there's a, hey, you stole the cow. Billy stole the cow. We got to deal with the cow. And my grandfather wants to get the most restitution, right? He wants to cut off Billy's pinkies and get a second cow back. Billy's grandmother wants to defend Billy. Even if she knows Billy did wrong, she wants to get the least punishment. And that's where the other old people come in because they're eating and they're talking and they're drinking and they're having a good time. But they're also with one ear listening to what's going on. And so when my grandfather goes, oh, you were going to cut off his pinkies, you get them, them going, rrr, 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 no, 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 no. Oh, this, this chicken parm is terrible. Like that tells my grandfather that's too big of an ask. You're not going to get it. No one will accept that. And when the his grand Billy's grandmother says, well, all right. He'll give back the cow and he'll say he's really, really, really sorry. Well, the old people on the other end of the table are like, it's terrible. And tells it that's not enough. All right. Well, you know, a goat and two chickens. That tells my grandfather and the grandmother that it's kind of in the ballpark of what's acceptable. And she goes, all right, well, we don't really have a goat. How about just two chickens? All right, a goat. So what does this now mean? It now means the old people now finish their meal. They talk about the old times. They talk about kids today, and they complain about young people because that's what old people do. And then they come to me and Billy, who are sitting there growling at each other. Kick your... And then my grandfather goes, you're going to get your cow back and you're going to get two chickens. And I'm going to go, two chickens? Cut off his freaking pinkies. And he's going to go, shut up. You're going to get two chickens and you're going to like it. And that's the way it's going to be. Okay? And I go, okay, grandpa. And grandpapa walks away. Meanwhile, grandmama goes over to Billy and goes, Billy, I'm very disappointed in you. You're going to give back the cow and you're going to give him two chickens. And he's going to go, what? I'm not going to give back the cow. Do you know how much? And she's going to go, shut up. You're going to give back the cow. You're going to give two chickens and then you're going to be over. And you go, okay, grandma. And all the old people are like, ha, 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 kids today suck. And so young people are regulated by the rules of old folk. They're told what to do by the old folk. So we are very conservative societies. They don't want to rock the boat. They want to have agreements. Nobody's interested in cutting off Billy's pinkies because whatever he did wasn't bad enough to, to, for people to want to do it. So it's not going to happen. So these are conservative societies. But the young people are being told what the rules are by the old people. Now notice the chiefs are not part of this. Why? Because the chief is pretty young. The chief is doing war. The chief is doing fighting. The chief doesn't want to be a part of this. The chief is not the lawmaker. That's the old people's job. Now, what happens is young people, me and Billy, grow up. And then young people do bad stuff. And so we'll have a sit down. and We'll be like, oh, you know, Joey just stole a cow. You know, didn't you steal a cow? And Billy's like, yeah, 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 that was, yeah, great. Never forget a thing. Be like, yeah, what was the thing? Didn't we cut off your pinkies? No, got my pinkies. Thank you. Thank you. It was like a turkey. No, we don't even have turkeys. It couldn't be a turkey. And then some other old people's like, yeah, I remember that. Uh, yeah, it was uh, two chickens. Like, oh, yeah, that's right. Two chickens. And so the, the generational law continues. But notice it's a case by case. It's continuously consensual. The group no one person makes the law. The group is constantly reinforcing it. But it's also a way for old people to regulate young people's behavior by te of telling people what to do and getting them to act by the rules of old people. So these are very conservative societies. So what is the biggest punishment? It's not the chickens. It's not to the cow. It's to your reputation. See, the thing that happens is Billy will now be known as the cow thief. And remember... All tried people need each other, which means if your reputation is the cow thief, 
Do people trust you? Does anyone want their daughter to marry Billy the Cow Thief? Ladies, do you want to marry Billy the Cow Thief? And so to be known as Mary, wife of the cow thief. Do you want your kids to be known as cow thieves? Right? Certainly, you're, the wife is going to have to is going to be a worse marriage than Billy would have had. And certainly their kids can't be leaders. So their kids are now going to have to fight that reputation. Now, the good thing is that's probably it. In a generation or two, it will end because there won't be anyone who remembers Billy. Billy, you know, people will die around the ages of 30 or 40. Like this is an important part. By old, I mean 40s and 50s. If you're 40, if you're 40, you're old. You are old by a modern definition of old if you're around 40 in this this society. If you're 50, you're ancient. If you're 60, you get called old in your name. This is the characters in Game of Thrones, right? The old man, the crone. You, suddenly they add old because you the only way to describe you is as old. Because no one remembers you as young. Everyone else has died 20 years or earlier. And if you reach your 70s, you are like the trees. You are so ancient, there is nobody alive who can remember a time when you weren't. You. There's nobody. You're like Queen Victoria. That that was Queen from 1836. And then Queen Elizabeth II is kind of the same way. 1836 to 1901, right? When she died, she had outlived two to three generations of people. No one was alive who could remember a who the king was before Queen Victoria. They were all gone. And they've been gone for decades. And so reputation is the biggest punishment in the society. Remember, everybody needs each other. So you don't own anything, so you can't really, really give up chickens or whatever. But it hurts your marriage prospects. It hurts your leadership chances. It hurts your war importance for the next generation, too. Your children will be labeled son of. And so we see how law works. It's old people who know the traditions, who are constantly negotiating for a consensus so that the punishments are never too harsh. But at the same time, are harsh enough to regulate young people's behavior. And the biggest threat in the law is to one's reputation because it hurts your value in the society. All right, that's our nomadic horse peoples, or nomadic peoples and nomadic horse peoples. Thank you very much. Take care. Be safe. Stay healthy. See you in the next episode.